Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Brankley and welcome to my three-part series on risk communication. Part one, why do we need to standardize risk communication? This video has been rated novice, which means it's accessible to everyone. If you have any questions or comments about the content or use of this video, please comment below or email me directly. So before we go any further, let's stop. I mean, really stop. Okay, now that I have your attention, I'm gonna ask you a question and without looking up, just give me the best answer you can. How many individuals who are at a high risk for sexual reoffending will actually commit a new sexual offense after they have been in the community for five years? Give me an answer from zero to a hundred. Ask a friend if you want, brainstorm. You know what? I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. Starting now. So what were your final answers? Okay, okay. Did anyone say over 80%? Okay, interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What about 40 to 50%? Ah, very interesting. I was not surprised, yeah. Did anyone just say it depends on how you define high risk? Because that's actually the best answer. Aha, a trick question. Well, no, Mr. Connery, it actually wasn't a trick question because our concept of danger or the likelihood of future offending are dependent on our underlying assumptions about risk. So risk is not a series of ordered categories. You know, it's not a typology. It's not even a stepwise pyramid. In fact, if you go out and observe risk in its natural habitat, you will actually see that risk is a dimension, just like height or temperature. Our job in risk assessment is to figure out where a person is on this dimension and communicate that to others. For example, let's look at Bob's risk level. No, 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 not Bob Seeger. Our Bob is just an example. So this is Bob's actual level of risk, but how do we describe it? You know, it's, well, it's closer to the high end, definitely, but somewhat closer to the middle than the higher end, definitely not in the, this is hard, okay? Let's see if anyone made a tool to help us out. Okay, here's one tool. It says Bob is high risk, great. Thank you, tool one, but, you know, I like to be sure about things, so let's see if there are any other tools out there that could help us. Oh, hello, tool two. Okay, so you say that Bob is moderate high risk, so that's a bit different from tool one, but tool one only had three levels, and this one has four levels. You know, does moderate high risk from tool two mean the same thing as high risk in tool one? What about the high risk group from tool two? Is that even higher risk? Ugh, you know, this, is, this isn't making it any easier. Let's go for a third tool, see if it's a tiebreaker. Hello, tool three. How do you divide up risk? Okay, tool three, you're telling me Bob is in bin seven. Okay, um, well, what do I do? You know, is Bob high risk? Is he moderate high risk? Is he in bin seven? Do I just take the two tools that are close enough to each other and ignore the third tool or discount it in some way? 
Or do I do some eyeballing and try to, I don't know, um, guesstimate the differences, you know, by looking at the average distance in each tool and then if I, no, no, <laughs> that, that, this isn't going to work. No, 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 it's possible. We take the international date line, multiply by the time zones, divided by the accelerated rotation of the Earth, uh, carry the wand, and uh, allowing for the vernal equinox on the topic of cancer, he might just pull it off. <laughs> Poppycock. I don't think that's going to work at all, Ernest. Because using more than one tool is normal, it is a challenge for both the readers and writers of risk assessment reports to make sense of these different kinds of tools. This kind of reminds me about vanity sizing at clothing stores, especially in women's clothes. You know, a woman might be a size 8 at H&M, which can translate into around a size 6 at The Gap, but... You know, it's a size 10 at Zara's. And I mean, it's just ridiculous. You know, whether it's clothing size or risk level, the result seems to be determined more by the values and characteristics of the clothing store or the risk tool, rather than the characteristics of the individual being measured. I mean, this is a serious problem. We have to take it seriously. Let me show you some real life examples. In the left-hand column, you have a selection of risk assessment tools commonly used to measure risk for general crime in Canada. At the top of the right-hand column, you have a distribution of percentiles and below it, I'm gonna show you how the percentiles relate to risk levels on each tool. This is the LSCMI, the Level of Service and Case Management Inventory. It has five risk levels somewhat evenly distributed except for a small, very low risk level. The Level of Service Inventory Ontario Revision, a variation on the LSCMI, has the same five risk levels, but they are very differently distributed. The very low and the very high levels seem to have flipped, with the very high risk level being half the size as the one on the LSCMI, and the very low risk level being twice as big as the one on the LSCMI. The Service Planning Instrument, or SPIN, is a very popular tool in Alberta, Canada. It has three risk levels that are not normally distributed. The low risk level has over half the entire sample. That means almost all the LSCMI moderate risk level would fit in the spin low risk level. More shockingly, the entire LSCMI high risk level is within the moderate risk level of the spin. The spin high risk level seems to be better described as the very high risk levels from the LSI tools. The Saskatchewan Primary Risk Assessment Tool from Saskatchewan, Canada, has the opposite distribution of the spin. Most people are in the high risk level. And finally, the HCR20, a very commonly used tool, has no percentiles. This makes it difficult to compare risk between people and describe what is a typical or unusual result. This is a limitation of all tools that come without percentiles. To get an even more concrete sense of the problem, let's look at the moderate risk levels for all the tools. The moderate risk levels cover almost the entire range from the 16th percentile up to the 90th percentile. This highlighted band is the range of scores which someone could have and plausibly be rated as moderate on all five tools. Again, I say plausible because the HCR has no percentile ranks. This means that only 4% of the people in the population will have consensus across the five tools. Now, that is a lot of disagreement. Disagreement between tools may be important if the tools are measuring different constructs or if they're measuring the same construct but in a different way. But all of these tools have similar elements and are measuring similar constructs. The disagreement is largely due to boundaries and the sizes of each risk level. So what are we going to do? Risk levels based more on tools than risk? Will anarchy reign? Find out next week if one risk framework can rule them all. Same risk time, same risk channel. Well, I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Please feel free to share it for teaching or training purposes, or, you know, just to fill awkward moments at parties. The companion slides are linked below in the description, and I just ask that you reference the content. 
Uh, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. I will continue to deliver new content each week. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or comments.